All right, well, as I mentioned, the Oscars are uh, this Sunday, and uh, many great films are up for awards. And I thought that tonight we should take a look at some of my favorite movies from the past year, you know, sort of review everything before the big award show. Once again, uh, join me for Conan on the Isle Oscar edition. <laughs> Song's weird. All right. Uh, <laughs> our first feature is Good Night and Good Luck. Good Night and Good Luck, the story of 1950s news anchor Edward R. Murrow's battle against McCarthyism. It's been nominated for multiple Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Now, they devoted a tremendous amount of energy into making the film historically accurate, from the clothing styles, the smoking on the air, shooting the whole thing in black and white. Still, though, I got to tell you, I watched this movie. Some of the scenes seemed a little off. It didn't sort of feel, you know, 1950s to me. It wasn't right. Take a look at this scene. No one familiar with the history of this country can deny that congressional committees are useful. It is necessary to investigate before legislating, but the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one, and the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. Cassius was right. <laughs> the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Good night. <laughs> good luck. This doesn't seem like it. This isn't good. All right. All right, next up, ladies and gentlemen, is King Kong. Now, a lot of people were really surprised King Kong was passed over for a Best Picture nomination, but not me. Now, one big problem that I had with King Kong was the music. The story takes place in the 1930s, but the filmmakers clearly wanted to use music that would appeal to modern viewers, and frankly, I think it hurt the film. Check out this emotional scene between Kong and Naomi Watts. You'll see what I'm talking about. feature is Capote, which received numerous nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor for Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, actually, I thought Philip Seymour Hoffman was brilliant as writer Truman Capote. So brilliant, in fact, that I'm afraid his performance rubbed off on the other actors working with him, influenced their style, and I think it hurt the movie. Look at these scenes from Capote. You'll see what I mean. There is one singular reason I keep coming here. November 14th, 1959. Three years ago. Three years. I asked you not to ask about the murder. <laughs> it's absurd. Did you? Did you fall in love with him? I did not answer that. Truman. Are you kidding me? No. Your portrait of those men was terrifying. Terrifying. Thank you. Come back here. Dad! <laughs> All right, our, uh, our next nominee is Paradise Now. It's nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. This gripping Palestinian thriller takes a look at the lives of two would-be suicide bombers. The film is powerful and topical, but unfortunately, it's undermined by some really lousy dialogue. Take a look. مع كل هذا بفضل يكون عندي جني في راسي لأن عايش حياتي الشحيم اللي احنا عايشينها احنا ميتين بالحياة شدودك على الموت غير اللي أمر منه هذا مو سدعية هذا انتقام انتركوا انه بطل في عنا خيارات تانية كيف الناضل يفتحونا مجالات لأمن ضال لو في عنا طيارات كان بكنش في عنا استشهاديين كتير عسكريين وانت موش قوي اتهم لكان خلينا نكون متساويين بالموت ما في جني هاي خلال يذكرها بالراسة الله العظيم استغفر الله العظيم 
It's a gripping scene, actually. Next up. Next up is The Chronicles of Narnia, which is nominated for makeup and its incredible visual effects. The Chronicles of Narnia is the big screen adaptation of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and it was intended to appeal to children. Well, the director uh, apparently has a history of directing horror movies, and uh, that's what he had done before, and I don't think he's gotten horror movies out of his system. For example, during the tender and innocent scene where Lucy meets the half-boy, half-goat, Tumnus, well, watch it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Were you hiding from me? I, I, I'm sorry, my name is Tumnus. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Tumnus. I'm Lucy Pevensey. Oh, you shake it. Uh, why? <laughs> I... I don't know. People do it when they meet each other. <laughs> <laughs> and our final film tonight, Brokeback Mountain, the movie that got the most buzz going into this weekend's Oscars. Now, the strength of Brokeback Mountain is the tender, tasteful portrayal of the gay relationship between Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal's character. Which makes you wonder, why couldn't the director pull off tasteful portrayals for all the characters in the film? Take a look. You'll see what I'm talking about. What if you and me had a little ranch somewhere, a little cow and calf operation? Be sweet life. No, I... I told you, it, it ain't gonna be that way. You know, you... You got your wife and baby in Texas and... Hi, guys! Oh, Hi. Hi. Love you. Now, I, I'm sorry, I just want to say something. Uh, this is just my opinion for a second. But I, I personally, I can't believe that Brokeback Mountain is getting so much publicity because despite the hype, it is not the first movie to depict a homosexual relationship between cowboys. I know a lot of you think it is, but it's not. I don't know if you remember this, but a movie called South Texas Madres uh, was made, this is a long time ago, with John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. That movie got pretty hardcore. Take a look. I don't know much about thoroughbreds, horses, or women. Them that I did know, I never liked their too nervous and spooky. They scare me. Being around you pleases me. Ah. Easily one of the most stupid and immature things we've done. <laughs> In 12 to years on the air. That takes... That was wrong. All right, well, we set a nice tone for the evening. Uh, we're going to take a little break. When we come back, Alec Baldwin's here. Stick around.